always figure in our state, we're figuring that is 100%. We look at where the deterioration is and what it is. Don't be caught with the old cliche of throwing the seam in there because you're not dealing with the seam. Like I say, as long as this pressure down here don't exceed the design pressure of that vessel, I got no problem with it running. Now another thing, <clears throat> on a case engine, I'll draw this out. Oh, you come this way, and you come like this, and you go like this. Now if you can follow that, this here is the fire door, right here. This is the water leg above the fire door, this is the water leg below. And after you look at a bunch of engines, over the years, you can just about lay your money in where to go. Most case engines, if you give me about three or four ultrasonic readings, I'll just about guarantee what the engine will run at. This here area above the fire door is a bad area because a lot of times it wasn't cleaned out. It's down in behind there, it's hard to see. Unless you take a mirror and a flashlight, you can't make sure that's clear. You got stay bolts up here, and I've seen them plug way above these stay bolts. And also back in the bottom water lake, you had deterioration. It's hard to clean up. And another thing is, <clears throat> when they flange that steel, there's a tight radius here, a little bit of a little straight here, and a tight radius down. You don't bend steel without either stretching it or shrinking it. So on the inside, they probably shrunk it here a little bit and pulled the grains open here. So you end up with a thinning area anyhow. But surprisingly, this water lake back here can be extremely thin. And that can be down, you know, 80, 90 thousandths. And you can still pass inspection because you only have an inch wide. And it's supported on both sides by a radius. And the radius makes it terribly strong. So you come in and look at this. Again, you figure out the area and the load on it. But theoretically, being in it is in that bend, or that, that OG, they call it, it can be terribly thin because there's no area there. It's only inch wide. And you can get away with it there. So I think what I'm saying is you can inspect the engines in different ways. You can inspect them to shut them down, or you can inspect them to keep them running. And I think this only is more than common sense. If you go down here on a case engine and find a thin spot, that this doesn't condemn the whole engine. You better know what kind of load you've got there and what, what it's going to do to you. Because without figuring, the, without figuring the loading, you don't know if you've got trouble or not. But these are the things you look at. And we made up a set of charts that ran them off on the computer that tells us, well, a stable pitch, what they, what they are is it, it's a, uh, a chart that, so we don't have to, because we've got 12 different inspectors in Kansas, <clears throat> And to keep everything the same, we made up charts so we didn't have 12 different people doing math. Like on one chart, for example, over here, we got like a 100,000, 120, 130, on and down to probably half inch. Then over here, we got a stable pitch of like, you know, two inches, two and a half, three, four, five, all the way out. So you come along and take a, an ultrasonic reading, and you say, okay, I've got. 300,000 stick, the stable pitch is so and so, you come over here, and where the two meet, that's the, that's the, the pressure you run that vessel at. We made up charts for the barrels and all the flat plate, so that everybody is looking at the same chart and giving the same numbers. And then you get into those examples where you've got something a little bit different, and then you have to sit down and hand calculate it. So the other things I want to get into is that we have a lot of people, all of us, have spent money on steam engines. A lot of us have spent some pretty hard money probably. But yet you find the same person, after going through all the work, doesn't want to spend $17 for a soft plug. Or he doesn't want to spend $150 for a new safety valve. As far as I'm concerned, the soft plug is probably the cheapest money you can buy. The cheapest safety device and probably the most foolproof. 
If you notice the safety valve chat he has up here on the top, it's marked ASME standard. Well, one thing we do <clears throat> up north, those soft bullets come out every year. We look at it, as long as we can see the ASME standard marking, we put them back in and run them, and the rest of the blood looks good. What we're running into is I, I had people telling me that I renewed my soft plug. I said, geez, what does that mean? Well, it was kind of melted a little bit, so I cleaned it up and melted it out of there, and I took some, some uh, wheel weights, a little bit of solder, mixed it up and put it back in there, and uh, went back to running it again. That ASME soft plug right there will melt 430 to 434 degrees. That's how close they are to beat code. Well, you can see a border at 150 PSI, the water is 361 degrees. You're not very far off from melting the soft plug the whole time. So that's one reason that we require now that we pull that soft plug out and we see the ASME marking on there. And that helps let us know that somebody has to renew the soft plug at home. Now probably the most, one of the biggest problems we had and probably has caused, caused the most fighting and the most screaming and yelling is the pop-off valve. That's been a problem. The pop-off valves today nowhere re resemble the old pop-off valves. The old pop-off valves were a heavy valve. If you look at most of these, you'll see that they have a what they call a, inside it has a bottom bottom bearing. It's a bottom bearing safety valve, which means the the seat in there is also supported by a bottom bearing in there. The new safety valves are strictly top bearing safety valve. So a whole different ballpark. The new safety valve will not do the job these old ones did. Last year, I think Chatty was up, the, up at the meeting, and we had a representative from Kunkel there. And as far as the company's concerned, once that safety valve pops, it's done its job. The safety valve is what it is, it's a safety valve, it's not a control device. The control devices you have are the draft doors, the coal shovel, the water handle, and the operator. Once the safety valve goes, somebody's done something wrong. Oh, Grant, there's instances where, you know, you're on a heavy load someplace, you break a chain to the, to the plow or the sawmill breaks a belt, you, you get caught. And there's probably the thing you can do about it. But once it pops, something has gone wrong someplace in the system. The new valves just don't stand abuse like the old ones did. One thing is that the, the valves that we're looking at today will only, another thing about a safety valve, they're only designed to handle 2% moisture in the steam. In the general scenario of a, of a pop valve going at a show is somebody's got the engine fired up, it's getting hot, they add a little more water, they add a little more water, pretty soon they got probably way too much water in it. Then when the valve lifts, it's seeing probably 30-40% moisture, which causes the, the valve to, to wire draw and cut the seats out. And when it closes, it's probably not going to close tight. Another thing is, when you do that, when you have a high water level and, and the boiler pops, the safety valve releases, when it carries that moisture, it also carries dirt. And our steam traction engines are filthy inside. And I don't care how well you wash them or what you do, they're still dirty inside. And when you fire up or move the engine, you're going to have something off the firebox or off the tube someplace, some dirt knocked loose. And when you have a high water and the safety valve pops, it's going to find itself out that valve and hopefully it doesn't become lodged under the seat. But that's what raises came with the new safety valve. The thing about the safety valve is when you get a new safety valve on there, it tells you the pounds our pressure it takes to open it. It also tells you the pounds per hour, which means the capacity, how much steam 
that valve can release. And again, going back to code, they have a call out for that because they've got a chart. You go by heating surface, that's the total area of the firebox that sees fire plus the tubes. And you multiply that by a given number, and that gives you the capacity. And a lot of the, most of the valves in the old engines were way overrated for what their job was. Now, if you see an engine popping, and uh, the safety valve is, is chattering, that pretty much tells you that the valve is too, is too small, or excuse me, too big for the job. Mm. It sees a little pressure jump, sees a little pressure and jump. It's not doing, you know, it's, it's too big of a valve for the job. And the same thing you get when it's too small. So when you have to rate the valve to the engine. So when we inspect an engine, you go up there, it's got the factory seals on it, it's got a tag on there, it tells you it's a V valve, it means it's four steam. It gives you the PSI it's set for, and it gives you the pounds per hour it's going to release. Then you know what you have up there. And it gives you one, one base to say that system is all right. Now the trip lever on it, again, the new valves are not as tough as the old ones. The manufacturers tell you that if you're going to lift the trip lever, that you have to have at least 75% of the rated pressure against the safety valve. So if you've got a safety valve set for 100 PSI, you don't want to be dinging with that lever unless you've got 75 pounds against it because you can damage the valve. Now another thing you'll find, if you start buying the safety valve size for the heating surface, you're gonna find them a lot smaller in physical size. And you can take a, a safety valve and say it has like a two inch thread on it. Well you can also, in that valve, they got different orifices inside. A, B, C, D, and E orifices which they changed to meet the pounds per hour. So a lot of times you come to a guy, you take out a big safety valve like this and put back on a little safety valve of a smaller pipe size. It's because with the... Theoretically, it's safe up to the head here. <clears throat> if you're gonna maintain <clears throat> As the plate thins with age and, and uh, corrosion, what we do is we want to remake, we want to retain that four to one safety factor. We don't want to alter that because to alter the four to one safety factor, you're altering the safety of yourself, you're altering your investment, and you're altering the hobby we have. So what you do is you lower the uh, PSI to retain the four to one safety factor. And by doing that, you can have a brand new code vessel sitting here and a 1911 whatever, and they're both the safe because they're both inspected to the four to one safety factor. Now, if you, if you leave the PSI alone, like a lot of guys say, you know, I've got an original engine, I still carry 175. Then what you've probably done is you've uh, kept your PSI the same, but you've lowered your factor of safety. Now, I'll grant you, no rule is a hard rule because everything changes. And I think that's one thing that we, we found out when we started the inspection program we did. We got the bright idea to go to five to one because it sounded better than four to one. You were making things better. What we discovered is that I don't think it would have been maybe a half a dozen engines in the state running at five to one because you're trying to make it better than the day it was brand new and that's asinine you can't that can't be done so what we went back to is we took uh, all the engines a bunch of engines they all took a bunch of engines <clears throat> some that we knew that were code i had a 50 horse case art cost his old engine that was a, a code asme stamp vessel so we measured the plate and measured the stable pitch on that engine and a lot of other engines and we derived that the old engines were probably built around a four to one factor of safety. So we thought it'd be quite improper to 
raise the factor of safety because you'd be trying to you'd be trying to make it better than the day it was new and you can't do that. 